Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about biarticular muscles. Okay, so starting by talking about muscle attachments. So a muscle has what we define as its origin and its insertion. Um, so really, it's just the attachment of the muscle on either end. Um, classically, we define the origin um, as usually the more proximal and relatively immovable attachment. So the more stable attachment that is usually more proximal um, or the insertion is usually the more distal or relatively movable or less stable attachment. Um, now I say usually uh, because that is not always true. Sometimes it is exactly the opposite in terms of how we define the origin and the insertion. Um, so knowing which is which uh, for the most part, follow we follow these rules, but in some um, there are some cases where it's the exact opposite. So, like levator scapula is an example where it's the opposite. Uh, so, in that case, it's just a matter of knowing which one is your origin and which one is your insertion. So, during a concentric contraction, the at, the attachments are brought closer together. Usually, the insertion or the more distal, more movable attachment moves closer to the origin, the more stable, immovable attachment. Um, usually it's a matter of um, which end has more mass. So if you think about inertia, um, and when, we're, when the muscle's contracting and force is being applied to both attachments, whichever one has less mass, whichever attachment or whichever limb or whichever you know, bone or whatever it's attached to, whichever has less mass, is going to be the one that moves. So whichever has less mass is going to have less inertia and is going to move in response to the force that was applied by that muscle contracting. Um, so generally speaking, when the muscle contracts, the insertion will come closer to the origin. Now that isn't always the case, um, because again, there are examples where the origin and the insertion are opposite, um, but even in the case where the origin and the insertion are as we defined here, um, we could also have what's called a reverse muscle action. And so an example of that would be like, uh, if we do a chin up or a pull up. Um, and so we're, our hands are anchored and we're pulling our body up. So in that case, like we look at the elbow flexion that's happening. If I just did elbow flexion like right now, my insertion, is moving closer to my origin, like if I look at biceps brachii. If I now held on to a bar and flexed my elbow, now I'm pulling my body up to that bar. So in that case, my origin is moving closer to my insertion of biceps brachii. Okay, and so that would be a reverse muscle action, where in both cases, that's a concentric contraction of biceps brachii, but the difference is which attachment is moving toward the other. So in general, the insertion usually moves toward the origin when the muscle contracts, but in a reverse muscle contraction, we can have the exact opposite happen. Uh, it's the actions produced by a muscle during its concentric contraction that are described as the actions of the muscle. So like when we went over the muscles of the body and we talked about the actions, you know, like biceps brachii flexes the elbow and uh, supinates the forearm and flexes the shoulder. Those actions are the actions of the muscle when it concentrically contracts. So when the muscle shortens and it produces force, what is the resulting action? And those are the actions that we list as being the actions of that muscle. But muscles are contributing to other actions. They're still contracting and contributing in other situations like with an eccentric contraction. So for example, if I do a bicep curl, the biceps brachii is, is contracting concentrically as the elbow flexes. And then it's also contracting eccentrically as the elbow extends because it's contracting to control the descent of my forearm against gravity. If it didn't contract eccentrically, my arm would just fall with the weight of gravity and I would probably hurt myself. Okay, so um, biceps brachii is contracting both on the flexion and the extension, but the difference is that biceps brachii produced the action of flexion with a concentric contraction, which is why we say that that is one of its actions. 
versus an extension, biceps brachii is merely contracting to control the, the movement of the, the forearm against gravity. So we wouldn't say that that's the action of biceps brachii, but that is a time when biceps is contracting and producing force and contributing to some other movement or control of some other movement besides what we would define as its concentric actions. Okay, so a uniarticular muscle is a muscle that only crosses one joint. Therefore, it only acts on one joint. Muscles only act on the joints that they cross. Okay, so if a muscle does not cross the glenohumeral joint, then it does not have actions on the glenohumeral joint. Okay, muscles act on the joints that they cross. So a uniarticular muscle is very, it's a very simple muscle that only crosses one joint and only has action on that one joint. Okay, I just said all that. Uh, so the actions of uniarticular muscles are generally simple because they are only capable of causing motion at a single articulation. Um, so there isn't a whole lot to say there. It's usually a very uh, simple, very obvious um, analysis there. Now, multi-articular muscles are muscles that cross more than one joint. So they're a lot more complex. They're capable of much more complex motion uh, because one muscle can act on multiple joints at the same time. Uh, so it gets a little bit more complicated. So multi-articular muscle is a muscle that crosses two or more articulations. A bi-articular muscle means that it specifically crosses two joints. So if it crosses exactly two articulations, it's biarticular. A biarticular joint is just a type of multi, or a biarticular muscle is a type of multi-articular muscle. Okay, so multi-articular muscle is two or more articulations. Biarticular is just specifically two. So a muscle that crosses two joints, we could call multi-articular or biarticular, and they're equally correct, but biarticular would be more specific. Um, so we do have muscles that cross more than two articulations. Uh, like if you think about wrist flexors and extensors, they're going all the way from the humerus. So they're crossing the elbow. They're coming down, crossing the many joints of the wrist and some of them, the many joints in the hands. So those are multi-articular muscles that are crossing definitely more than two joints. Uh, the actions of multi-articular muscles are usually very complex. Uh, because the movement at one of the joints that the muscle crosses is going to affect the movement that is possible at the other joints that that same muscle crosses. So there are some advantages to this and some disadvantages. I'll talk about the disadvantages in the next video, uh, but for now, the advantages of multi-articular muscles. Uh, one is that the activation of a single muscle can cause movement at more than one articulation. So it's more efficient than if we were activating multiple muscles to move multiple joints. So one muscle moving multiple joints, that's a very efficient design. Also, they're capable of producing a more consistent force because they can maintain a more constant length. So if we think about the length tension relationship, uh, a muscle that crosses more than one joint potentially can control its length of sarcomeres even while it's control even while it's contracting. So we're able to produce a more even force. Like a uni uniarticular muscle that only crosses one joint, as it's contracting and moving through whatever the action is, its capacity to produce force is changing. So as it as the muscle gets shorter or longer, the length tension relationship there is changing because the length of the muscle is changing, the amount of overlap of the sarcomeres are changing. So that muscle's ability to produce force is kind of going through an arc as its length is changing throughout the movement. With a multi-articular muscle, we have a better ability to alter the length because we can be stretching the muscle at one end and contracting at the other. And essentially we're able to control the length of the muscle to optimize the length tension relationship as we're moving through the motion at one of the joints that it crosses. 
So movement at one articulation may help the muscle maintain its length while movement occurs at another articulation crossed by the same muscle. Okay, so I have an example of that. Uh, if we think about a leg press or like a hip sled, like what we see here, um, what's happening is the acetabulofemoral and tibiofemoral joints are both extending during the leg press. Okay, so if we look at the quads during this leg press, of course we have four quadricep muscles. Rectus femoris is the only one that also crosses the hip. So all four cross the knee and all four extend the knee, um, but only rectus femoris also crosses the hip. So as we're um, extending the hip and the knee, all four quadriceps muscles are working to extend the knee, but at the same time, rectus femoris is being lengthened at the hip. So rectus femoris flexes the hip, but we're going into extension of the hip as we're pushing out on that leg press. So rectus femoris is being lengthened at the hip and shortened at the knee. And because of that, rectus femoris as a whole is able to maintain its whole length much more consistently compared to the other quadriceps, which are all shortening as the knee extends. Rectus femoris is shortening with the knee extension, but also lengthening with the hip extension. So because it can maintain its length better, it has a more favorable length tension relationship than the other quadriceps muscles. So it's able to contribute a more consistent, even force throughout the motion. So this causes rectus femoris to contribute a steady amount of force as its length is held relatively steady compared to the other quadriceps muscles that do not cross the hip. Okay, so that's just one example. Of course, there are many muscles that are um, being lengthened or shortened as we go through um, a leg press. So we can probably go through many other examples even just within the same exercise, but that was just one to illustrate the point. Okay, so that's all I have for you here, and in the next video I'll talk about the disadvantages of multi-articular muscles. Thanks for watching!